Hi, I'm Checo Varelse, and you're listening to the Cine Pod. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. What's up, Ilya? Happy Halloween as we record this. Happy Halloween to you. This must be like a pretty major uh, holiday in the Ben Rock world, I was, isn't it? I was pointing out to Alicia, my wife, that my yard decorating game should, on paper, be much better than it is. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't really do very much. It's hard for me to get excited about any holiday. But now that I have a son and now that he's old enough to be interested in stuff like this, I feel like this year we stepped it up a little and probably next year we're going to have to step it up a whole lot because... My guess is he'll be way, way, way the hell into it. But I will say this is just my ham-fisted segue. I did have a good Halloween because Catchers, my Audible series, finally got released last week. So Nice. How's it doing? People listen to it? I mean, it's like anything else they on, don't a, tell you. on a streaming platform. I, I reached out to our executive and I said, like, about when will we know if it's doing well? And he was like, we'll know in the next week or so. We'll we'll have some stats and we'll see. But who the hell knows? I, I will say we've been getting mostly positive feedback and uh, not to beat it over everyone's head. But if you're listening to the sound of my voice, that means that uh, you like listening to stuff and you probably have a phone. And if you have that, you could go on Audible, get a free 30-day trial. Or if you already have Audible... Catchers, the series I directed and co-wrote with Bob DeRosa, is 100% free if you're an Audible subscriber. And it has a great voice cast, great uh, music, uh, original score by a guy named Steve Moore of a band called Zombie. He's a really well-known guy in the in horror circles. Uh, stars Billy Gardell, who's Bob on Bob Hart's Abishola, Horizon Guardiola, who was on The Get Down and In American Gods and uh, Netflix's Dare Me, like, you know, we, we, uh, Maryland Rice Scub from 24, David Patrick Kelly from The Crow and The Warriors and uh, Twin Peaks, on and on. We, we have an amazing cast. I'm very excited about it. So uh, if you can hear this and you don't feel like spending any money and you're not on Audible, get a free 30 day trial. And then uh, cancel it afterwards. I don't care. Listen to it. Give us, a, give us an on- audible cares. Give us an honest rating. <laughs> if you hate it, feel free to say that. But it would be great to get a rating. And a re- if you're even so inclined to review, I, it would it would mean the world to us. And maybe we get to make a second uh, season of it or something else for Audible or who knows. But uh, it's been a great experience, and I'm excited to have it out. That being said, Ilya, who is on the show today? Returning champion, Checo Verace. I think Checo has been on the show more than anyone else. Yeah, I think so, too. We'll have to count, but I think that's at least five times now. And uh, and you know what? He's such a great guy. I, I love having him on the show. It's so much fun to have him. Each time's great. He always says something that like just deeply impresses me from a philosophical standpoint. We always talk about how our show is about art, craft, and philosophy. And uh, Checo, to me, is someone in the philosophy. He's very much art, very much craft, but he's someone who I always pick up little nuggets of philosophy from. And, and you're going to talk about Dope Sick, right? Because, I mean, Dope Sick just won an Emmy, right? Yeah. Is, is like, he is won, a big it, deal. It won several Emmys, one of which was Checo. Checo, Checo won an Emmy yeah. for his work on Dope Sick, which is well deserved, and we're yeah. and, we're really happy about that. And uh, after you're done listening to Catchers, if you haven't seen Dope Sick, go on to Hulu and watch Dope Sick. Uh, <laughs> Let's get our priorities straight here. Don't don't you dare watch Dope Sick first. Go listen to, to Catchers and then go watch Dope Sick. For that's real. what you're saying. Yeah, no, because you, you know you you kind of put it in that order. No, no, so, that was you know. that was quite in, that was very intentional. <laughs> that, on my part. that was intentional. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. No, no, yeah, I was yeah, going for it. that. Uh, no, Dope Sick is uh, freaking brilliant, uh, has an amazing cast. The person people talk about probably more than anyone else is Michael Keaton, who is a freaking national treasure. He's such a great actor, and he's so great in this, and uh, and he's so great as like a flawed character in this, because like, you want him to be your doctor. I want Michael Keaton mm. to be my doctor, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and he's also probably my favorite villain so far to come out lately in the uh, the Marvel movies. It's it's really good. It's in the last couple of, of Spider-Man. I have seen them, and yeah, he's awesome. But uh, yeah, Dope Sick is wonderful. Checo's work in Dope Sick is definitely worthy of an Emmy. It's a story 
that like, you know, we've seen a lot of movies and TV shows that kind of bop around to different worlds connected around the same thing, but even like characters who may or may not even really meet each other. A big thing, and we talk about it a little bit, is Steven Soderbergh's Traffic. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's interesting the way they chose to kind of, this isn't just hopping around the horn in terms of the characters and their stories, but it's also cycling backwards and forwards through the years. It takes place, you know, from the 90s right up to like a couple of years ago. And uh, it's pretty amazing. And it, you'll you'll hear him talk about his influences and the style and working with different directors, one of whom is his wife who directed some of Dope Sick, one of whom is Barry freaking Levinson. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, yeah he uh, he definitely did some cool stuff, but I don't want to spoil it anymore. So let's get into our close focus. We, we kind of have a hodgepodge this week. Some it weeks, was a busy some weeks we're, like, week. yeah. we're like struggling. We're like, oh, God, what are we going to yeah, talk wh- about? And this, <laughs> this week, yes, I remember like, a few weeks ago it was like, wow, we're really scratching heads. Are we are we going to yeah. do, do something? But but this week it's like, holy crap, a lot of stuff happened. I mean, first of all, we got to let's jump back to Kanye. Kanye's having some. Uh, a, a pretty hard time now. You know, not only getting dropped by his agency, but getting dropped by Adidas. It sounds like some others are lining getting up dropped to drop by him. everybody. Yeah, yeah. No, like Goodwill said, they won't even take his stuff if it's what? if it's yeah. <laughs> Like uh, it, it, it is a cold day in hell when Goodwill says no, no, no. We we got enough stuff. We won't take he, your your stuff. He had a private school in Simi Valley out here, and it closed its doors apparently. And people are paying like fifteen thousand a year for their kids to go there, which. In terms of private school, actually isn't that expensive. But uh, I don't know that I would send my kids to a private school run by a guy who proudly talks about how he's never read a book. Kanye (laughs) literally has said that he's never read a book. I I find it hard to believe that he's never read a book. Any book, Garfield at large, something, anything. But yeah, I mean, it's he's just doubling and tripling down on on hate speech. That's why. And I feel like he's in that billionaire class where or he was. He's not a billionaire anymore, apparently. But, you know, he's in that class where, like, no one ever says no to him. And I feel like he he can just I, I, I'm unclear if he's like being like Lars von Trier and just being some kind of a weird edgelord and trying to shock us by being shocking and crazy or if he really means it. And if he means it, then it's then he's a he's an awful person and. I, it makes me sad because I liked some of his music. Well, did, did he actually go through and buy Parlor? Because it seems like that's what everyone was reporting a couple of weeks ago, that he was like all set to buy it for some, you know, very large number of dollars per share. And uh, maybe that's I, I why have, he's not a billionaire anymore. Maybe. He has, no, he's, he's not a billionaire because he lost his Adidas deal. Mm. Some people are like complaining that he was canceled. And I'm like, Kanye West is not canceled. If Kanye West decided to have a concert tomorrow in any city in America, it would sell out. Uh, like, undoubtedly. He, He's going to be just fine. I'm not I'm not worried about Kanye West, but there is kind of this weird cultural phenomenon. And, you know, you see it also. And this is a ham fisted segue uh, with also mega billionaire Elon Musk buying oh, Twitter. Right. Yes. And Elon <laughs> Musk saying shocking garbage. Just I, I think either just to shock people. He seems too smart to just throw it all away for no reason. But he went ahead, bought Twitter. People are leaving en masse. Yeah. And, um, and let's just let, let's mention some of them, like Shonda Rhimes and a friend of the show, Alex Winter. Alex I mean, Winter, which makes me sad. I follow Alex Winter on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, but and there's a bunch of other people, too, and they're just kind of keep lining up. So it's like more and more people are saying, hey, I've had enough of Twitter and I don't want to. I mean, it's it's really interesting, sort of the news that has come out lately of like uh, various sort of like right wing leaning groups trying to test the censorship and like using racially charged offensive language to see if they can get away with it now. Uh, I mean, the thing about Twitter, uh, I mean, I'm I'm pretty active on Twitter. Are you active at all on Twitter? No. So for me, like leaving Twitter is not yeah, not not re- not really so much impacting my life. But I know quite a few people that Twitter is their preferred you know, social media network of choice. And they, they like to communicate that way. They want to get their news that way. They want to have meaningful conversations that way. That's that's I have met a lot of friends on Twitter. I've been on Twitter, I think, since 2009. And I have like clawed and scraped to get a decent followership. And by decent, it's, you know, like 12,000, I think. And uh, that ain't nothing. And it's not like if I say to my 12,000 followers, go do X, that they will say yes, master, and do it. Probably a lot of them are bots, uh, you know, but but here's the thing. I've actually made good friends on Twitter. The job that I just finished, Catchers, I was reached out to 
by an Audible executive on Twitter. Hmm. I was DM'd by an Audible exec on Twitter to see if I'd be interested in maybe doing that show uh, or in do, in pitching them some ideas. <laughs> they didn't know about that show. We pitched them that show. You know, uh, I think Twitter is generally... Twitter can be whatever experience you want it to be. When I am unfortunate enough to wallow into political Twitter, I inevitably walk away sad. So I well, well, you're one of those tend to a, avoid it. You're one of those people with a little blue check mark after your name, are you not? Yeah. Yeah, well... Yeah, uh, I, I, I got very... Verified. Did, did you hear that they want to charge verified people twenty dollars a month? Yeah, yeah, I heard that they're <laughs> testing the waters with that, and I would pay them nothing a month for yeah. that. Like it's not, it's not something that really gives me any benefit. I don't know. I'm kind of waiting to see if Twitter goes like to pure hell, and if it, if and when it does, I'll hop off the ride. There's another service called Mastodon that's kind of the same thing, and obviously doesn't have nearly as many people on it. I'm guessing. And I, yeah. I've been kind of poking around on Mastodon to see, you know, it also. I mean, I, I just rolls like, off the tongue, Mastodon. <laughs> I like it, though. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's extra named, syllable. Named after a woolly well, uh, Ben, we really should, though, get into the other big story right now is uh, DC. You know, DC and Warner this Brothers. This is a positive story. This, this is a story that makes me extraordinarily happy, actually. Well, uh, James Gunn and Peter Safran will lead the film, television, and animation divisions of... Uh, DC, and it's not going to be called DC Films anymore. It's going to be called DC Studios, which is interesting because they already kind of have DC Studios, but I'm assuming this is another DC Studios. So DC Studios was like their social media and like web sort of content division, but now DC Studios, uh, they've got new heads and they're going to report to David Zaslav. And yeah, we're going to see probably a whole lot of changes coming from DC. They're probably well, t- tired of, uh, I'm sorry, well, go ahead. Jump no, in. I'm going to just say it's about freaking time. I mean, like, you know, Marvel's had Kevin Feige for all these years and they've had enormous success. And I wouldn't say that DC has been floundering, but I would say DC has been inconsistent. Now, that's not to say Marvel has been super consistent, but Marvel has made an internally consistent universe of movies that all kind of fit together. And, and I don't think that DC needs to do that necessarily. I, I don't. Uh, but I think that probably they're tired of being second place occasionally now and then to, to Well, I mean, to the, thing about D- the thing about DC is like for a hot minute there when Batgirl looked like it was going to come out, you had Michael Keaton as Batman and then Ben Affleck as Batman. And then at the same time, you had Robert Pattinson as Batman. And all three different stories, three different tones. And similarly, you had obviously Joaquin Phoenix as Joker and you had Jared Leto as Joker. And then you had, uh, I forget the actor's name, but the new Joker in The Batman. And it's like, I can see a value in it where it's like, you know, if you go to the comic book stand, you know, there could be a graphic novel with one interpretation of Batman and the Joker. And there could be a new issue of the comic with a completely different look and interpretation. Like, I feel like there's a valid way to say that. But here's the thing about James Gunn. I feel like he gets superheroes in a way that nobody else ever has. And I point to obviously Guardians of the Galaxy, which was, you know, characters nobody gave a shit about until he made that movie. And then his interpretation of the Suicide Squad, which is, in my opinion, brilliant. And then his spinoff of Peacemaker. And I'm still angry that we haven't gotten a season two of Peacemaker yet uh, because Peacemaker is so original. Uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, Aquaman pretty big hit mm-hmm. for uh for warner brothers dc it, it, you, you have any idea how much money aquaman made and i i like, like aquaman didn't ap- appeal to me at all but just take a, a wild stab like how much money one aquaman. billion dollars you're correct more than a billion 1.14 billion dollars to which i say you go you go james wan <laughs> i'm so excited the guy who created the original saw movie is making that kind of uh cash for the studios yeah. good for everybody yeah that's it's it's really impressive so anyway yeah. so i think that just about wraps up our busy news week let's get to the interview with checo Barasse. here's checo the cinematography podcast interview I'm here, I believe, for the fourth time, if I'm not mistaken, with the amazing Checo Varese. Oh my God, thank you so much for coming back on, Checo. Go ahead. Sorry. It feels like yesterday. <laughs> like yesterday, we were talking about all these projects. I love your podcast. I follow oh. it. And thank you so much for letting me be part of it. Oh, no, no. We love having you on. We love having you on. Yeah, we, we had done kind of a general episode about you, and then we talked about It Chapter 2, and then we talked about them, and now we're here to talk about the limited series that you won an Emmy for. I was so excited for you when I saw that happen. It was like, yay! Thank you. It was, it was very unexpected because visually Dope Sick was the very contained, mm-hmm. very 
emotionally charged. So the, the whole concept was to be subdued and, and, and be a, a, a fly in the wall, as you say in English. And it was a fly in the wall that got an Emmy. So it's great. It's a very big yeah. fly, I guess. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's the skill to which you were a fly on the wall. It was, you know, the precision that you hit it with. Uh, yeah, we, and uh, you said it. I, I didn't have a chance to say it. it was for Dope Sick, an amazing, amazing limited series, which I watched on Hulu. I, I don't know. Was it made for FX or Hulu? No, it was made for Hulu and it's uh, an original limited series. Well, for whoever doesn't know, Dope Sick, it's about the, the epidemic of opioids in this yeah. country. The very recent, very, very recent. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, it's a very unique, I mean, there are epidemics all over the world, the cholera in Congo and, and, and Ebola, whatever, and Brazil has measles. The only country in the world that has an epidemic on opioids is this country, is the United States, because of the power the pharmaceuticals have. So it's an ongoing process. You know, they, they're losing lawsuits left, right, and center. And they are, which they is, are now. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, let's get into it. I mean, Dope Sick is, uh, like you said, it's not a show about like tricky, crazy camera visuals and outrageous shots. It's a very internal, very character driven story. And to me, it reminded me a little bit of uh, Steven Soderbergh's Traffic in that it's like you're tracking four or five different stories that don't really uh, directly intersect or intersect you know, much later in the show, but, you know, they're kind of all happening in their own worlds a little bit. And, you know, one of them is the Sackler family, like reminded me a little bit of succession in in the terms of uh, these crazy rich people making crazy rich people decisions that uh, us mortals might or might not understand. And, you know, then Michael Keaton is kind of like a small town doctor, you know, like what was your approach to creating the world? You know, like in, in uh, traffic, like everyone has a very, very signature look, but this series, there are subtle differences, but it's not like a tobacco filter on one. And, you know, it's not crazy, crazy different from one to the next. Well, the genesis of this whole, my whole process was a meeting I had with Danny Strong the mm. creator and writer and the tectonic plates force behind the whole process. Uh, yeah. I've been involved in this for probably now, whatever, 10 years. And I knew Danny from another project we did together. He's a friend. We've had dinners. And, and one day my wife, Patricia Regan, which is a director and directed two episodes of Dope said, you know, Danny has a new project that Barry Levinson is directing the pilot and the first two episodes I'm directing in two episodes and Danny directing the other two. At that point, we didn't know Michael Cuesta would direct other episodes. So Patricia mentioned that there was this project. So I prepared a, a, a pitch and, and very nervously prepared a pitch because Barry Levinson, it's one of the few people in the world whose name is Barry Levinson. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Name and last name, it's a big deal. <laughs> I usually never quote movies when I do pitches because you never know what the feeling of someone is in a movie, unless you quote Apocalypse Now and The Godfather, which no, or, or Citizen Kane, which nobody can argue. <laughs> Every other movie you were to quote, it creates a little bit of an anxiety in me because you may not like that movie, you know? So mm -hmm. anyway, in the pitch, I thought of sort of three concentric circles. Imagine the, the circles of the, the Olympics, you know? but there are like three of them. And in the center of the circle, it's an oxycotin pill. And one circle is the minors or, or the victims. In this case, Dr. Sinex, the Michael Keaton character, um, Caitlin Beaver, extraordinary actor. So that's one circle. The other circle is the civil servants, the people that actually, the, the prosecutors that mm -hmm. fought this fight. And the other circle is the Sackler, the rich people. So the first circle was, I sort of inspired myself into the, the deer hunter, the Michael Cimino movie. Oh, wow. uh, not obviously not the Vietnam part because it doesn't apply, but the minor, the, the, the factory, the, this sort of very working class. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, but, I totally see it. But done with respect and with, with appreciation and they have a taste for things that is color, but there is a lack of color in the environment. Um, the prosecutors or the, the civil servants, people that for a meager federal salary risk their lives or, or put their lives at stake 
doing a 10 year prosecution was based on, on the movie about the tobacco industry, the insider, the Michael Mann movie about the oh, tobacco industry. Such a great movie. Oh, Dan Pespinotti did an amazing job as cinematographer. It was crazy. In the Sattler, if you extrapolate the sexual interpretation, it's I'd try shot. It's <laughs> crazy rich people that do crazy rich people things as you very well explain it. And it has real world consequences, you know? So I, yeah. this glitzy, glamorous, almost fake world that only exists in the 1%. So when I presented this to Barry, Barry was super enthusiastic about the three concentric circles. But if you remember the movies, they're very subtle looks. I assembled a, a fantastic crew, uh, David Lee, my gaffer, Rick Stribling, my key grip, longtime collaborators of myself. They both have Oscars with other cinematographers and now they have an Emmy. Nice. And then my operator, Joseph Arena, which is a wonderful operator and my DIT, Daniele Colombera. So we all sat down and talked about how to make this different and how to make this subdued and how to make this a signature with, with a non-existing pen or, a, a, you know, yeah. those pen, like a secret ink signature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so because it's sometimes I find easy to get a Sharpie and sign a big black line like the former president uh, <laughs> or change a map, but it's, it's more <laughs> complex to be subtle. Uh, at the same time, as a cinematographer or as a filmmaker, you want to keep the interest of the audience. So it has to be entertain entertaining. It's another, probably not a good word about opioids, but it has to be engaging. Yeah. Compelling. Compelling. You know, you see the offices there is, so there's a prosecutor office and it's in a strip mall and the, the, the walls are gray and the desk is wood, but we managed to turn off the lights, you know, and have meetings with only maybe a, a standing light. Mm. And as far as camera dialogue goes, I always say the same and, and, and on the risk of repeating myself, because you and I have been married now for four episodes, <laughs> uh, but I do believe that camera, like lighting is the difference between writing in, in prose and writing in poetry or writing a sonetto. Uh, the camera moves are the commas and the dots and the exclamation points. Mm. So you write in prose, but the camera move is the one that allows you to stop a sentence and make your reader think, you know, or make a comma and take a breath or put an exclamation point. Or if you want to be bold, you, you type it in caps and bold, you know? So yeah, that is what the camera does. And, and we were very aware of that. So were there subtle ways that you went about differentiating? Because it isn't just the world of the DEA and these miners in Virginia and the Sacklers, uh, but also you're going through time periods. Like it's this series hops through time, like it goes from 1997 to 2002 and, and back and forth. Were you doing anything to differentiate the time periods? No, it was a conscious decision not to hammer the audience with that. So I felt very comfortable not to establish a different look for the time periods. And, and, and let me explain my reasoning a little bit is, okay, let's say you go back to the 1800s and then, okay, you use a different lens and uh, maybe the color correction is different or even you go both and go black and white. But the difference between 97, 98 and 2001, 2003 is basically, there is no difference. The cars are the same because who has... Unless you live in Los Angeles, uh, in the rest of the world, who has a car that is three months old? You know, everybody yeah, has yeah. a car that is 10 years old, seven years old, five years old. So in, in 2000, you're driving a 1995 Toyota or whatever it is. But if you're 2005, you're driving a 98 Toyota. So it doesn't change really. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you have to be aware of a little bit of like the phones and, and, and the traffic lights, maybe. So to me, it's. I believe that the audience is very smart. I believe that the audience is smarter than me because the audience is the collective audience. So the million people that watch it, it's a million brains yeah, yeah. together. So the audience is very smart. So hitting them in the head with, with like a tobacco filter for this scene or not, <laughs> whatever filter for the other scene, to me was a little bit too much. Um, yeah, yeah. In this case, I've done it and we all have done it. So. 
what I, what to me, the difference was the three circles. You know, that was a very conscious decision. The three circles had a different look. The minors, it's a little bluer and more leaning toward the greens and the blues. The civil servant is more stark. Imagine everybody has a tie and everybody has a jacket. And the Sasslers is this sort of gold rich, uh, endless amount of power, you know, like camera lower always on Richard Sackler to express the power. So that was more the language. Which circle does the pharmaceutical reps, uh, which circle do they fit into? The pharmaceutical reps are with the Sacklers. Okay. You know, they're, they're these wannabe people that, I mean, some of them, and this is it's not in the series, but in conversation with Danny, some of them made $60,000 a year. Some of them made a million and a half a Jesus year. Christ. And, and those are the legal ones. Uh, those are the ones that didn't do anything illegal, which is uh, pill mills and selling under the counter and, and, yeah. and giving it to the drug dealers or whatever. This is people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year mm-hmm. by pushing a drug that they knew it was addictive. They knew it was creating disasters and still they did it. They knew, they knew it was killing people. Well, and in the case of the, I don't know if you'd say he's the main character, but one of the main characters played by Michael Keaton in the show, it's like he starts skeptical, then he himself becomes addicted to Oxycontin. And it's so interesting watching an actor like Michael Keaton, who is a national treasure, like such a great actor, and someone who you want, you want your doctor to be Michael Keaton. You want to go into the doctor's office and have someone that awesome and reassuring be your doctor, and then see him kind of fall to it. And I don't, I don't know if that was based on an actual doctor who that happened to, or if that's an amalgam of, of people. It's a, an amalgam of people. The, the two prosecutors are based on actual people. Mm-hmm. Sort of the sister Beth and, and the other doctor that tries to save the, the addicts are based on real people. Oh, good. The bad guys are based on real people. The, the minor daughter, it's, it's, an, it's a combination of many stories. And Dr. Phoenix, it's a combination of many stories. But I mean, that, that kind of has to be the case. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure that you could find one story within the Oxycontin epidemic that might encapsulate it. But, you know, for storytelling purposes, like I feel like it's a, they're good journeys for characters that are believable within this world. But and, you know, this is maybe a, a writing and directing question, but I think it, it definitely goes to you as cinematographer like um, you did the strain. <laughs> so you've done stuff that uh, was about an epidemic of sorts, in that case, vampires. But this is all this is a true story or, you know, most this is a slightly fictionalized true story with absolutely true elements in it. So when you're doing something that is based on something that really happened to real people who are still alive, walking the streets today, what's the level of your commitment? Because I think it would be equally valid to say, I'm just here to tell the story and the stories in the script. And it's not my specific job to honor those people. And it would also be equally valid, in my opinion, to say, like, it, it's really important to me that I get every detail right, that I give these people the world to create the, the absolute reality of this. Where do you fall in that? Okay. <laughs> when I do each chapter two, it's a completely fictionalized story. Mm-hmm. There is no clown in my closet, I think that comes and eats me alive. I'm looking under the desk right now to check that Pennywise, uh, exactly, there is no clown in the closet. But as a cinematographer, I have to believe that I'm doing a story about a clown in the closet. Mm-hmm. Because I, if I don't believe it, the audience won't believe it. So no matter what I do, I get involved and I get passionate about whatever I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Because I have the innocent sense that my soul gets transmitted into the frame somehow. <laughs> and if I don't believe in that, then my soul won't be in the frame, mm. no matter what I do, a music video, a drama. But in this particular case, it's even more important because it's about real people. I have to yeah. honor people that are alive, that are about to die because they're in oxycotin, or they're about to fly the next private jet to their house because they, they, they make billions. So to me, it was extremely important to be truthful, honest, and to be involved with the story. I was the only cinematographer in eight episodes with cross boarding directors. So what, which meant I was working seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Oh my God. You know, 
So, you know, like you said, you worked with, uh, what, three or four directors, one of them being your wife. I actually didn't put that together. Uh, I should have. And one of them being Barry Levinson. Like, you know, I mean, like these are large figures. So I can't put myself in your shoes. But I, I, if Barry Levinson came in and asked you to do a shot that was inconsistent with one of the other directors or you felt was out of the style of the show, how would you approach that? I mean, I feel like these are all people who you would just have to talk directly to them. It's not like you're going to go to the producer. They're not guest directors. These are all integral people to this show. When I was a young activist in Latin America, I learned to be very politically correct with the police officer that wanted to put me in jail and with my colleagues that wanted to put the police officer to sleep not metaphorically. Yeah. Uh, so you learn how to navigate the world in a very political way. To answer your question about the specific shot or the specific moment, directors are not only talking to the actor, directors are talking to the audience. And I, at the end of the day, serve the director. I mm. don't serve the project. I serve the director and I serve the script. So it's a very delicate balance of trying not to step into somebody's shoes. And as you said, you work with a producer. So most likely than not, they all have the same vision. Mm -hmm. You know, they all have different styles, different ways of communicating with me or with the crew or, or with the project, but they all were very aware of what we did and how the style was and we had conversation. But at the same time, they have their very specific feelings about certain scenes. And with the respect that those directors deserve, you just don't argue with it. And, yeah. and, and if you see the series, you see a heavy hand on the performances from maybe Barry Levinson and Patricia Riggin and Danny and Michael Cuesta had a heavy hand because Danny was very smart and he chose Michael for the episodes three and four where, where like the craziness happened. So Michael gave that craziness to the camera oh, line. It, it was so great. It was, I mean, like it just, it was, it was such a shocking moment to me too. Like it, it was something where it's like, no matter what, I wanted to trust Michael Keaton and then crazy Michael Keaton came out. It was so fun. Uh, working with your wife as director, have the two of you worked together before in, in this capacity? We've done five features and probably 10 TV shows together. So a lot of stuff. Okay. So you, so the two of you are used to working with, with each other. It's the best, it's the best relationship. We work 24 seven, you know, at breakfast yeah. with coffee, we're talking about the shots and at night before turning the lights off, we talk about tomorrow. That was what I was going to ask you. It's like when working on a film, it's like, you know, you don't take it home with you, but when you and your spouse are both working on the same project, is there an off switch? No, there isn't. But it sounds like that's something that you love about it. Oh, I adore because there is no off switch anyway. Even if I'm not sleeping with you and you're directing the movie, hopefully we don't sleep together. <laughs> um, you go to your house and, and you think about the movie and you're mm. tempted to text me, but you don't because out of respect, you don't text me. And I'm in bed thinking about tomorrow's and this great idea and I don't text you, but I email you in the morning. So you avoid the middleman. <laughs> you just talk about it constantly. And there is an off switch because obviously we have a now 15 year old daughter. So that's, that's the reality check. And she wants to be a filmmaker also. So oh, wow. she helped, she helped us. I mean, that's what I think she wants. Then she'll change her mind or not. It's up to her, but yeah. it, it, there is no off switch. And when there is an off switch, it's a decision. It's wonderful. It's amazing. I recommend it. Highly recommend. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> And that's cool that the two of you have worked together a bunch. You know, th this is something that I think is key to what makes the show work. And you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but it's like the the performances are sitting at the center of the show. There's so many really amazing, strong performances. And there are some very live moments. Do you approach the lighting any different in a way to give, like, to physically give the actors more maneuvering room. In other words, like, there's a way you could light a show where it's like, they have to hit this exact mark, they'll be in focus here, they won't be in focus there, but more importantly, they'll be out of their light, it won't look right, everything doesn't work, and then there are, are approaches where it's like, you've got four feet of playable space, go crazy, do whatever you're going to do in there. And when you have something where, you know, you have not just great actors, but great actors with naturalism, 
do you light it any differently to kind of give them leeway? Or, I mean, like, I know they're all pros. And if you said you have to hit this mark and that mark, they could all do it. But is there any give and take in something like this, which is a, a more of a naturalistic show to begin with? Again, not not to keep going back to the strain, but the strain is very stylized. This The style is naturalism. So is there a combination made for the actors? Yes, there is. There is, a, there is an accommodation for the actors, but basically my style even in the strain or in it chapter two or, or in a sci-fi project is I come from documentaries, as you know, and I come mm. from news, um, and that it's embedded in my DNA. So I'll walk into a room and I say, where is the sun? Even if there is no sun because of the stage, where would the sun be? You know, yeah. and what time it is, it's 3 PM. So I put the light in the place that hits the bench and hits this, and I light that background. And so I start with the canvas. And I'm not the only one that does that, obviously, but that's how classic painter, you know, you start with the canvas and then you put your secondary characters and then you put your primary characters. And then all of a sudden the girl with the pearl earring is in the foreground, you know, yeah. that's how you, that's how you paint. So that's how you paint a, a, a ring or a space. And then when you see the rehearsal, you accommodate the, the particular situation. First of all, you don't go to Michael Keaton and tell him hit a mark because he'll <laughs> he deal with the mark. Uh, but I imagine that he's that he's a pro though. Like I mean, like you know, he had to hit some marks in Birdman. <laughs> yeah, but the one thing, the one thing you you could whisper in the ear is, you know, at the desk when you lean forward, you no, know, you're more lit, and when you lean backwards, you could be within yourself more because there is less lighting. So that kind of conversation, you I can have. You know, there are other mm-hmm. DPs that have a different conversation. But in the case of this, there are subtleties that develop in your characters that, you know, there are some characters that will sit against the window because they've been in jail forever, you know, so yeah. they want to have the light from the outside. And there are some characters that are shy and will go in a corner. You accommodate that. Um, in the case of Dobsic in particular, we were very naturalistic in a stylized way, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You know, so we shot in large format. So which means the focus was crucial. My focus pullers were getting a bottle of wine every weekend because they were doing fine. And Mm -hmm. I bribed them in that way. Um, (laughs) But it was, it was very specific, the focus. So we could differentiate or you could attract the audience gaze to whatever was in focus or whatever was out of focus, you know. Which camera was it? Uh, we shot it in the Venice one. Oh, okay. used for the first time, the little cousin of the Venice called the FX3, which is a tiny camera that looks like a, you're still like a SLR camera, but it's yeah, wonderful, it, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it's a wonderful tool. In fact, there's one scene that we run out of time because whatever happened, happened and life takes over. And then we only had an hour to do three kids driving in a car with one of four kids, one of them being overdosed and we lost some time in the company move and et cetera. And we only had one, one hour, which is impossible to do two and a half pages in one hour, a car moving, yeah. you know? And I said to the director, if you trust me, I'll shoot it with the FX3 with nobody around me. So I sat in the passenger seat when the point of view of the passenger guy was, and I sat in the back and I lay in the ground of the car as if I was dying and looking up with the little camera holding it like, and wow. when, I, when I needed to to the driver, I literally to the non-pleasure of the first AD <laughs> and the safety <laughs> officer, I lean out of the window, holding the camera outside and, and just pointing it at the driver. Wow. And in an hour, we shot three pages of dialogue, you know. That's, that's, I mean, that's just scrappy. That's, that's awesome. That's so cool that you use the FX3 like that. That's the documentary on me. Yeah. In that documentary, you would do that. And if the story is strong and the moment is strong, it doesn't matter if the camera shakes a little bit. It doesn't matter if it's, the focus is not perfect. No, but in that, that particular, in that particular scene that it's appropriate for it too. Exactly. Exactly. So you, you accommodate your tools and your lighting to the situation, or at least I try no, that's all. That's that's amazing. And it well, and it's interesting to hear you using that camera, too, you know, because like the Venice is maybe out of the price range of a of a film student or someone starting out. But that one isn't. And that's a four thousand dollar camera, my friend. Yeah. And by the time you finish putting everything you need, it's probably fifty five hundred. The Venice is ninety thousand. Exactly. I'm in love with those little cameras, you know, 
and I'm not making a commercial about Sony, but they develop that particular camera in a way that is extraordinarily helpful. I, if I were to do a short film or if I were to do, you know, a documentary, I don't take anything else. I just take that little camera and the two lenses and a battery in my pocket, you know, and you shoot everything you want. Well, cool. Is there anything about Dope Sick that I haven't asked you that you, is something you've been burning to talk about maybe that people haven't asked you about with it? I would add that as a cinematographer, you get spoiled with a project like that. I mean, some people get spoiled because they do the, the sci-fi thing with all the resources in the universe. I get spoiled by crying on set or laughing on set or, or being emotional on set and telling important stories. And when I say spoiled is I'm getting a few scripts and I'm reading them and I'm like, I wish somebody would write about January 6th, you know, or, no, or, or I'm sure or, someone is. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is a series. I'm doing a commercial. I would love to be, be, be that series, by the way. Um, I think there are important stories that we're telling and there are important stories that we're not telling. And the one thing that happens after doing Dope Sick is you go and say, oh, I've done procedurals before. Am I really interested in another procedural? Well, not maybe not. Let me wait for another script. And yeah. that's, where, that's where Dope Sick becomes... A dream because you're telling a story that it's important. In the last project I did, which is Daisy Jones and the Six, it's a series for Amazon. It's about a band from the 70s that get together and it's a very famous book from the Reese Witherspoon's book club. I shot a couple of scenes with a Super 8. Really? Film? Yeah. Film. Sweet. Super 8. Because, because the, the character... One of the characters has the Super 8 and he's sort of recording this event. So I said, well, let's shoot in the Super 8. And everybody was saying, let's shoot it with the Venice and then make it look like the Super 8. It'll never look like Super 8 if you shoot it on the Venice. <laughs> exactly. So, so they, yes, it may if I spend 250,000 VFX, you know, putting grain, it won't never. So I need to like depth of, depth of field and everything like it, yeah. it optically wouldn't look anything like Super 8. No. So I have the Super 8 camera in my garage. We bought a Super 8 camera, we, we did a test, and I shot the whole, I mean, it's not a whole scene, but it's pretty much three minutes worth of Super 8 and a couple of, you know, establishers. So you explain why this person has a Super 8 in her hand. Yeah. But it's the right tool, and the audience will understand it. The audience is extraordinarily smart. So you always have to serve the audience. Can you say anything else about Daisy Jones and the Six? Uh, like, yeah, uh, it's a 10 episodes, I believe. Two DPs, Jeff Cutter and myself. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I think it's coming out in March, but it's great, you know. Well, hopefully we can have you back on the show when that comes out. Of course. I'll have more than happy always. We'll have you on as often as you want to be on. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Congratulations. Oh, wait, we didn't even talk about the, your Emmy. You won the Emmy. I'm looking at it in the, in the Zoom shot. I, I see it behind you. Yeah, the Emmy was unexpected and in the speech, I said, I, I wish I could cut it in five and, and share it with the other four nominees, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then I, I crumbled the paper and I just said that this, basically, this Emmy goes to the victims of greed and relentless capitalism oh. that has destroyed the pharmaceutical and the lives of so many people. You know that per year in this country, more people die of Oxycontin than all the wars this country has fought combined in the oh 20th God. century. I believe yeah, it. Per year. Per year. I have a family member who, who, whose life was wrecked by it for some time. You know, I, I know what they went through and it's, every step of it is, is, is its own horror film. Every, it, it would have been a subplot of Dope Sick for sure. Yep. I hope the next one, it's another Bob Woodward book, but uh, I'm still waiting for that. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, that's good to show up. Well, congratulations again. Uh, we're, we're so happy for you and happy to have you back on the show. And uh, Dope Sick really is a masterpiece. And I think it's one of those shows people are going to look back on year after year. It's one of the things that freaks me out about everything being streaming is that I, don't, I won't have a DVD of it on my shelf or a Blu-ray or something that I could refer to. And if Hulu got absorbed and they just decided to get rid of it, I, how would you find it? But I feel like it's one of those things that like I will refer to because it, it's got it, it's got such a great look to it and a great feel to it. And, and I feel like it's something that if you said like, oh, like, you know how they did blah in Dope Sick, people would be like, yeah, you know, like they, they get it. Yeah, I hope it has a long life also because it's very respectful of humanity. 
Well, uh, congratulations. I, I ask you this every time, but where can people find your work online? Uh, you know, obviously, go go watch Dope Sick right now on Hulu if you can. But uh, other than that, where, what's the best place to see your stuff online? Well, there is my website, but that's only a little piece of it. But I think watch movies that matter. And then it doesn't matter where I did it or not. Just watch projects, <laughs> watch projects that matter. Thank you so much for coming back on. Thank you. Well, that was Checo Varese. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, Checo. And uh, as you heard in the interview, uh, he's got a new show coming out, so uh, we'll have him back before you know it. Pretty soon, Checo will just be co-hosting this with the two of us. I, I look forward to that. I think it'd be so much I, fun. I think uh, we, Checo we is... He is so cool. He's the coolest. He's really I, I cool. love to. I want to hang out with him. I just love talking to him every time. And customer of Hot Rod Cameras. It's always a, it's always a delight to see him. I, I love it when he comes in. So no, he, he's the best, and his work is all just top notch. Congrats for the Emmy, and I I think it's the beginning of many more. All right, so Ben, it's bill paying time. But before we get into the the bill paying, I just got to give a shout out to your friend, my friend, friend of the show, Janelle Riley. I don't know if you saw her Halloween costume, but she won Halloween playing uh jobu tupaki from uh everything everywhere that i that was just so great so just great. A, a couple hours ago she asked me if i could marry that the video of her with uh her dog wilbur with uh some audio from everything everywhere all at once but i think she figured out how to do it so oh cool well anyway that, yeah that was uh, that was really great so uh i gotta say that i didn't expect to see the everything everywhere uh costumes but uh the, it turns out there was a couple other people who had the same idea and uh but still janelle wins it was really awesome excellent it was excellent so okay so bill paying time Aperture helping to make this show possible and they're making some really incredible lights and I got to say that a little bird told me that the Nova P600C which is their flagship two foot by one foot LED light panel which is you know RGB it's got all these colors in it it's a you know a lot of popular panel lights out there well Aperture is their flagship this big one hundreds of them got used for a major feature film so it's like there's a certain DP out there all of this is uh, is all you know top secret they can't talk about it I can't talk about it but the fact that Aperture got a major major production so they got hundreds of these uh, Nova P600C panels out there I think that light star is on the rise, and I think that you're going to see a lot more of it coming up in the near future as soon as they can get the clearances from the studio to show some of the behind the scenes of how those lights are being used. And I think that that's actually going to mark a really interesting turning point for Aperture, which is always has been kind of relegated to not the biggest, highest profile movies and that's not going to be the case anymore. They now have clinched a part on that set. And I think that some of the big, big rental houses and some of the big uh, owners of gear are going to have to start looking at Aperture, certainly their flagship products like the P600C, a bit differently because it is a really impressive. It's the brightest two by one panel light out there. And uh, if you it's, it's not their cheapest light. We keep them in stock at Hot Rod Cameras now, though, just because really, if you were looking for like a, a world class big soft light it's hard to do better especially for the money and if you're going to buy hundreds of lights for a studio or for a project or whatever it might be nova p600c definitely take a look at it check it out at hot red cameras we keep them in the showroom and it's it's absolutely worth uh taking a play with and now short ends well ben it is our famed short end time of the show what is your obsession this week what are you what are you all about well, it's something that I th uh, is being pushed a little bit, but I think could be pushed harder, and I'd love uh, more people to hear about it. And it's a Netflix series called Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Oh, okay. And that, uh, yeah, Cabinet of Curiosities on the brain. Yes, and it is an anthology series in in the tradition of a Twilight Zone or a Hitchcock Presents or whatever. You know, maybe more Hitchcock Presents than anything else, because Guillermo del Toro comes out and personally introduces each episode with like an interesting little story, which, in my opinion, is I won't call it a misstep, but maybe the only thing that I wouldn't have done, because Guillermo del Toro is a fascinating person and he's brilliant, but he's not an actor, you know. But yeah, whatever. I just feel like it kind of draws my attention a little bit. But he's got some amazing directors 
weirdly, he's not one of them, although Guillermo Navarro, who was his cinematographer on many films, including my personal favorite of his, Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo Navarro uh, directs the first episode, but David Pryor and Catherine Hardwick and Panos Cosmatos, who directed the ultra weird Nicolas Cage movie, Mandy, and another movie called Beyond the Black Rainbow. And side note is the son of uh, George P. Cosmatos, the director of Tombstone, Leviathan, a bunch of movies. He was a really cool director. And Panos, unlike his dad, makes fucking weird ass, crazy, steer into the weird, go as weird as you can, (laughs) too weird for David Lynch kind of movies. And, uh, And I mean, like Mandy, I've watched Mandy twice. It's Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage in a Nick Cagey kind of thing. There's a scene with like a 10 foot chainsaw. Uh, It's it's not a subtle movie, but it is super weird. But he directed one of the episodes and, uh, you know, a big shout out. There's four DPs on the series. Mm. Uh, I hope I'm getting everyone's names right. Cameron Halt, Jeremy Benning, Anastas N. Mikos and Michael Reagan. Uh, and uh, I know Jeremy Benning quite well, and we'll have to get him on the show to to talk about this. Yeah, he did one episode. It looks like Colin Halt did the uh, majority of them. But yeah, I'd love to have him on. I haven't seen an anthology, like a horror anthology series, knock it out of the park this hard in a long time. I feel like in the 1980s, right at the same time, we had three anthology series. It was like 1985. They had the reboot of Twilight Zone, the reboot of Hitchcock Presents, and Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. They all went the same year, and I feel like they all kind of canceled each other out, unfortunately. They all kind of died an untimely deaths, even though, in my opinion, all three were really solid shows. I feel like this reminds me of the update of that, of, of a modern version of that, with a spin that is uniquely Guillermo del Toro. And uh, I'm a big fan of his work and a bigger fan of his mind. And a lot of this just feels like it comes right out of his mind. And he didn't direct the episodes, but he wrote a bunch of them. So, mm. Wow. Awesome. Well, I'll have to check it out. Sounds great. Yep. On Netflix uh, right now. So if you got a Netflix account, after you're done listening to my series on Audible, just go right in and, and watch Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities on Netflix. But first, listen to Catchers and then write a, write a <laughs> and review. And then do everything else. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't have yeah. dinner. Don't have breakfast. Don't go, go, Here's the, go listen okay. to Catchers. Okay, but but shut up here. Uh, uh, you can eat while you're listening to Catchers. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Because it's right. audio, you, you can you don't eat have to listen look at it. To, yeah, that's true. Listen, you you can you can make lunch, peanut butter and jelly, oatmeal, yeah. you, whatever you want. You can you can make some food. You can teach your kids how to read and do math while you're listening to Catchers. Wow, oh. you got your earbuds in, listening to Catchers, and then trying to teach your kid how to read. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great, great, Johnny. Great. Hold, hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to find You need to find out about creatures from inside the earth sometime. So you might as well find out now. Uh, all right. So then I also have something. Well, I, I don't know. I've got I've got something for my short end this week. That is, well, it's, it's a little bit retro. I happen to be on HBO or HBO Max, I should say. And I noticed that Nightcrawler, the 2014 movie uh, shot by Robert Ellswit, uh beautifully. Uh, is, oh, my God. Is, is back. And uh, I don't know where it went, but uh, I hadn't seen it sort of like on any of the services for a while. And maybe that was just me, but uh, it was it was there and I just kind of clicked on it and I watched uh, I watched a little bit of it. And I I remembered why and how much I loved that movie. And it's really interesting because I don't feel like a lot of people saw it, but I went to Rotten Tomatoes and I was curious. I was like, this is such a great movie. It was my pick, I believe, as as for best picture in in 2014. And uh, I was curious to see what other people saw of it. And it is like one of the highest rated movies on Rotten Tomatoes. Certainly one that's been out for a while and had plenty of reviews. Critically, it's a 95% and audience score is like 86, but it's way, way more than so many other movies out there. Like uh, movies that are are really, really highly regarded. And I want to say things like, you know, American Hustle or Baby Driver or Three Billboards or Gone Girl. I mean, People, if they try Nightcrawler, they seem to really, really like it. But I think that maybe just about sort of, uh, you know, a a dark movie, people were, I I don't know, turned off. They didn't uh, jump into it. It was directed by Dan Gilroy. And if you're one of those people out there who missed Nightcrawler somehow, here's your chance. It's on HBO Max. It's just arrived earlier this month. This is your chance to uh, to to catch yeah. this really fantastic movie that you you should have seen sooner. And now you get to and now you get to uh, now, you know. like 
Jake Gyllenhaal is an awesome actor, he but is. I think this is my favorite performance he ever gave. Me too. I think that and look, he's done a lot of great roles. I think this is his best role. I, yeah, I, 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 think, really I think it's, think it's, it's, I think it's his amazing. best role. Rene Russo is great in it. Bill Paxton. You even forget that Bill Paxton was in it. Who, you know, who tragically died shortly after this movie mm-hmm. came out. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a movie that I went to see knowing very little about it. Uh, I think I went to see a screening that my friend Janelle Riley was uh, doing a and a with the with the director afterwards. Janelle Riley, who won Halloween. That's right. Yes. And it was just something where it's like, oh, it's a Jake Gyllenhaal thing. Nightcrawler. I have no idea what it's about. You know, maybe it's about uh, someone who likes to go fishing. And uh, <laughs> and holy crap, that movie, that, it's such it's such an intense and brilliant character study uh, with uh, lots of amazing sequence work, amazing cinematography, but just like, it's one of those movies where you, you watch it to the end and you go like, God damn, but like every movie should pay its premise off this well. I think that some people might forget that Dan Gilroy is, is, is a very prolific screenwriter. He's written stuff like going all the way to back to, to Free Jack. I don't know if you ever saw Free Jack, but you know. Oh, was, yeah. yeah. In uh, the theater. And then Real Steel, Born Legacy, and many other things. But he's been currently working on Andor. Yeah, I mean, that. Well, well his, yeah, his, he's, his brother created it and is running it. His brother, Tony Gilroy, oh, okay. who, who's also not exactly a lightweight. He <laughs> he uh, wrote and directed Michael Clayton. He wrote Rogue One. And, and apparently they brought him in to do rewrites towards the end and he kind of second unit directed and they rebuilt the entire third act of that movie with him running it. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Well, anyway, uh, Nightcrawler, great movie. You may have missed it. If you did miss it, now's your chance. It's on HBO Max. Check it out. You won't be disappointed. It may, it may be one of the best things you see this year. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Also, that movie is like shot like I must be an extra in that movie because it's shot in studio city and parts of the valley that i'm in all the time like um, there's like a big scene at a gas station i'm like oh yeah i've i filled my car up at that gas station <laughs> dozens of times yeah it, uh, la definitely is like a uh, a character almost in that and and yeah. robert ellswood you know just uh you know always fantastic friend of the show you know uh, you should you know if you haven't heard his episode i mean that was one of the things i talked to him about when we had him on was like uh, nobody photographs la like him mm. he's definitely got it down so, all right. Well, uh, Ben, I think that just about does it for another episode of uh, Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. Where can people track you down if they want Ben Rock? Well, go to BenRock.com. And uh, for the time being, I'm at Neptune Salad on Twitter. We'll, we'll see if uh, <laughs> we'll see if that continues. We'll see if I just end up being at Neptune Salad at Mastodon at, at some point. But uh, so far, sticking it out with Twitter for a minute to see if it turns into, uh, you know, one giant Nazi rally or if it just... <laughs> stays kind of the same how about how about yourself where can people find you uh you can find me at hot red cameras hot red cameras.com that's my shop that's my company and uh if, if i'm not there you can still probably get a hold of me there uh i, I chat with people all the time who uh, have heard the podcast and want to want to get a hold of me you actually have to do the old school thing though of like picking up the phone and uh, yeah i know it's kind of crazy you're, you're not, not going to appeal to gen z that way buddy you're yeah, you're, yeah, you're kind of screwed gen, gen z does occasionally call but yeah it's true there's there's a little bit of a bit of friction there's a bit of like a wall there having to use the phone to to talk to someone but but it does happen. and speaking about a gen x gen z schism yeah listen to catchers cuz uh, there's a gen x gen z schism at the center of the story between the two main characters. Wait, uh, can I uh watch anything or listen to anything before I do that or no I ha- I need to do that first uh, no, no. I, honestly, turn this podcast off and just go listen to Catchers on Audible right now. <laughs> wow. OK, uh, I guess that just wraps up the show then for us. Uh, who do we have to thank this week? Firstly, we thank Catchers. Secondly, we thank Catchers. Uh, <laughs> catch, uh, let's go ahead and thank Alana Cody, who's kicking all the ass. And uh, as we head into this year award season, you know, her phone's going to be ringing off the hook with that's, uh, that's true. With, with all the prestige films coming out. And I, I, I think it's going to be a really exciting time to get to talk to some of the filmmakers behind those films. Uh, we, we, I've already started. So you're, you're going to catch up here real fast. Yeah. Uh, let's thank Kay's Alatrakchi who scored every scrap of music that you're hearing on this podcast. Uh, go to music by Check out his work. Uh, send him a, a freaking message. I, I don't care if you just say, Hey Kay's nice head of hair on you. Just say something. Hey, Kays, can I wax your car? That's not a euphemism. That's actually, can I <laughs> apply turtle wax to your car and make it shinier? He'll be happy to hear from you. Just say something to Kays. Uh, and then lastly, but never leastly, let's thank Ben Katz, who uh, I hope we didn't make his life too hard today, but uh, maybe maybe we did. But uh, Ben yeah, Katz, who- one or two edits for sure. 
for sure. Ben, who edits every episode, and you know, like I, I always assure our guests before we talk to them, we have a great editor on this show, and and the show is highly edited. So That's if you say something, lie. he really is a great no. editor. Yeah, Ben's the man. We're lucky to have him. So thank you, Ben. Yeah, it's why he's making the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> The big bucks that only the cinematography podcast can can provide. Thank you, Those, that that <laughs> cinematography podcast check. Yeah. Uh, all right, Ben. I think that's it. You want to take us out of here? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.